Welcome to Trinity Central. We exist to make God central to our lives and our world. You are listening to a recording of one of our Sunday messages. For more information, please go to trinitycentral.org. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ben. And we are going to enter into the section of our Sunday morning where we get to worship Jesus by hearing from his word. So we believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's here to fill us, to reach our hearts, to speak through us as we just uh, participated in worship. And the Holy Spirit speaks through his word. So we're going to do that together right now. We're going to enjoy God through his word. And for you, uh, if you've been with us for some time, if you're new, hey, you're going to hear about uh, a book called The Psalms. Uh, today. And we've been going through this book for probably three or four weeks now. I can't remember exactly, but uh, something like that. And last week you would have heard from our very own James Vanderwood. Guys, put your hands together for James Vanderwood. He, he, uh, He brought the word last week and he brought it out of Psalm chapter 14. And uh, he tied in that chapter with like a main theme about being born this way, being, being born or, or being tainted with something the psalmist writes in Psalm 14 about sin. And uh, as I was uh, catching James's sermon, as I, was, as I was refreshing myself in it, I was thinking to myself, man, I've just been doing day camps with kids, and it's so interesting trying to talk to kids about sin and evil. Uh, and sometimes it's easy to do that, and sometimes it's hard. For example, when a kid kicks another kid in the shin, uh, it's pretty obvious. One kid's crying, one kid is smiling, and you wonder who, who hit who. Uh, when we talk to adults, when we talk to grown-ups about things like sin and evil, sometimes it's like, ah, I don't want to talk about that. I'd rather do something else. Let's go to the coffee shop. Hey, I know a great one down on Granville Island. You want to hit that one up with me? I'd rather talk about that. The thing about sin and evil, I, I want to make a claim to you today out of Psalm chapter 22, is that if you guys understand this psalm with me today, I want to promise you that you're going to live in complete freedom from sin and evil by the power of Jesus this morning. Does that sound good? Yeah. It sounds like you guys would rather be in sin. All right, well, we'll just give me a couple more minutes and we'll see how you feel. So uh, the Psalms is a pretty dense book, pretty heavy. It's pretty moody. So, uh, you know, I I may able to make a joke. I'm going to make it, Rochelle. It's coming at my expense. Don't worry. So when we get married, often opposites attract. And I would say I'm the moody one in our relationship. So I I can see that the Psalms really connects with me. And David is uh, an author of many of the Psalms. And we see different types of joy and praise different types of laments and different expressions of anguish. And today is no exception to that. We're in probably one of the most anguishing Psalms of the 150 in Psalm 22. So David, who authored it, is our shepherd, warrior, king, and author, and poet. And so now we're going to turn to it. And so I wonder actually, because there's a few verses, they're short. I wonder if you guys could just stand with me. It probably helps uh, to engage our our bodies in what we're going to read today. I'm going to read through it. And then we're going to get to our word. So here we go. Psalm chapter 22, starting in verse 1. The author David says, a very famous line opening up. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cried by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy Enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted you and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man. Scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's rests. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. Verse 14. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. 
I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments up among them. For my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. You guys still with me? We're almost there. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. I'm going to add, can I get an amen? Amen. That's added. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before him. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. Hallelujah. That's it. That's God's word. Thank you, Lord. Thanks so much for standing. I'm going to go ahead and pray for us. I'd love if you just join me as I do that. Father, I thank you so much for this word. I thank you, Jesus, for the truth of your word, how it doesn't shy away from, from tough topics. I thank you, Jesus, that in your word, we don't just get a trite, kind of trivial approach to life. And Jesus, I'm asking you that you would pour out your Holy Spirit this morning, such that those of us who are really in anguish, like the psalmist writes, as David writes, that we would encounter your great love this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I know there were a lot of verses that we just read, but if you paid attention for like probably 40% of them, you probably would have seen that there was great anguish and extremely strong emotional language. Did you guys pick up on that? I don't have to work really hard to try to convince you of that. And from this... Um, from this passage in this, ch in this chapter of the Psalms, I want to make a claim that if you believe in, this in today's topic, that you will be able to live free of feeling abandoned. You will live free of feeling abandoned, separated, and alone for the rest of your life. You will live free of that if you believe in God off of this Psalm. Because our main point is that you are no longer going to be abandoned. No longer abandoned. And looking at this psalm, we're going to look at how David feels abandoned. And we're going to see how that points, number two, to Jesus being abandoned. And then we're going to apply it to ourselves. So I, uh, as a kid, I was talking about kids at day camps before. I remember as a kid growing up in suburban Toronto. And no one really cries for suburban kids. It's kind of like, you know what, they're kind of in the middle. Kind of not rural, kind of not city. Any suburbanites here? Woo! Okay. And I got invited to a birthday party by a rural kid. And he had this huge corn field. Or his dad did. Like, he didn't own it. And I got invited to play with all these other kids a game of tag. And what they did is they would go into the corn fields, and one person would be it, and you kind of had to find people in the corn field. Okay. It's kind of like tag in the corn field. Yeah, but, you know, you throw a little twist on things to see how much kids get excited about it. So we play a couple times, and... Uh, I'm not sure that I won. My memory's not that good. But what I do remember is the third time we played, I was it. And guess what they did? They ran out of the field into the birthday kid's house, and they left me in the field. I know. Oh, uh, mm. did I hear you deserve it? And, you know, as a kid, you learn pretty quickly that being abandoned by your friends it feels pretty brutal. Uh, it, it's, it sucks. And being abandoned in life is horrible. It's, it's amongst one of the most brutal feelings ever. You're alone, especially if you get like intentionally left by your friends. As you can tell, I need to, like some help with the scars of being left in a, in a crop, in a cornfield. But when I'm abandoned, right, I'm, I'm not coming back. They're coming. Let's play again, Ben. 
I'm like, you know what? I don't want to keep playing this game if you're going to keep abandoning me in the field. It's, it's really not fun, and it's definitely not the field of dreams. But more significant are different examples of abandonment and separation in our culture. For example, in family life, between a father and son, if there's breakdown between parent and child, if there's abandonment, there are different systems that we have in place in our system to try to help deal with that, like adoption. But that's no joke. And it's no joke when someone enters into marital strife and there's separation and perhaps divorce. Some of us here have even articulated that we've had to go through the minefield of that experience. In friendship, if you're not the cool kid on the block, you learn out pretty quickly your kids may abandon you. I imagine some of us here in this room were abandoned and bullied. Not the greatest feeling. Some of us put our whole life into maybe working and building a career to get let go. Maybe get fired, sometimes for reasons that are outside of our control. So these are all just little examples of how abandonment is pretty bad. And it's something that is very good news to talk about today because of who Jesus is. The point is that sin and evil works itself out in the ripping and tearing of our world to bring people apart. But that's not where Jesus leaves us. Hallelujah. So let's look at our first point. King David, he expresses feeling abandoned by God. Did you guys read? Did you guys, were you guys reading when I read that? I think you guys were probably just, you guys were paying attention though, I know. When we were reading Psalm chapter 22, it kind of felt like a yo-yo. It kind of felt like a roller coaster of feelings and emotions. There were two poles, these two poles. One pole over here, feeling abandoned by God, and the second pole over here, trusting in God's faithfulness. Did you see that? Let's talk about the highs and lows together really quickly. Let's summarize it. Verse 1, low, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the definition of this is to abandon or leave, to leave behind, to leave over, to let go, as in the examples that I maybe talked about. He says, lowly, I cry by day, but you do not answer, he says. And then going high in verse 3 to 5, he says, yeah, you are holy. Our fathers, so how could he say that he just said, like, I'm abandoned, but you are holy. Our fathers trusted, and you delivered them. They were not put to shame. Uh-oh, back down to a low, but I am a worm. <laughs> this guy has got to work this out. All who see me mock me. This is like verse by verse. Hi, yet you are he who took me from the womb. You have been my God. Uh-oh. Verse 6, sorry, verse 12 to 18. Bulls encompass me. I don't fully get that reference as a suburban guy. Sounds pretty bad. But it goes on. Like a ravening and roaring lion, I am poured out like water. My strength is dried up. They have pierced my hands and feet. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. Pretty low. Pretty bad. But high. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far off. You have rescued me. And then it continues from 22 to 31. Ah. Verse 26 kind of encapsulates that all of it. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. It's kind of a, a super erratic psalm. What is going on here? Has he got like multiple personalities? Well, I said, I put it in here. No, he doesn't. Because doesn't faith sometimes feel like this, friends? Doesn't faith sometimes go through the highs and lows of life? Anyone who puts their trust in anything can know that when that thing wavers, it can, you, you can be taken on this roller coaster of emotion. And in our psalm, the word trust comes up over and over again. It comes up five times in the first nine verses. And for those of you who maybe are churched, you might know that the word faith is really closely associated with the word trust. So that this whole thing is about the roller coaster that we are on of faith. That faith and belief, putting it and trusting in God can be difficult. But at the same time, the psalmist expresses how God can come through. And what's so awesome about this psalm is that we end, I mean, sometimes it's awesome when we end on a high, right? The, the reality of what David is experiencing and processing is ending in a place where he understands that he will dwell with God forever. 
and that God knows and sees him in his affliction. So sometimes, friends, if we are maybe moody or have an interesting disposition that is exposed to kind of the waves of life, we can feel ourselves taking on this roller coaster. But we cannot deny that the question that's being asked in our psalm is over and over again. Get this. This is going to be an important question for us. David, do you trust me? David, do you trust me? Well, if he looks at himself, hmm, not a lot of strength. When he looks at God, strength comes. I had the uh, opportunity a couple weeks ago to go wake skating in the Okanagan, which means that I got to be towed on a boat that I didn't own, on a wake skate also that I didn't own, by a captain, by a person on a boat. And for those of you who don't know what wake skating is, it's kind of like wakeboarding. And if you don't know what wakeboarding is, this is going to be a really long illustration. <laughs> Basically, you get strapped into a board. But in this scenario with wake skating, you don't get strapped into a board. You're just a little holding on to a board with your feet. And the, and the boat tows you. You're holding like a tow rope that's like, and you're supposed, to, you're supposed to, if you're good at it, pop up and ride the wake and enjoy the ride. But the, the trouble with wake skating, if you're not very good at it, is you can fall. <laughs> and when you put your trust in your own strength, you're going to learn pretty quickly how it goes. I was going to show you a photo of me in the water, but uh, thankfully the captain didn't take a photo. Well, I want to touch on this a little bit. When I spoke with the captain of the boat, before I got into the water, he said, Ben, you need to put on a life jacket. And I was like, well, we're probably going to go pretty slow. I said, you know what? It's probably good. Yeah, I think we should put on a life jacket. And then he said, if, if you fall, I'll, I'll come back. I'll, I'll pick you up. I'll circle around this way so that we don't hit you with the motor. I was like, that's, that's a great idea. Let's not do that. Okay, so what, what happens? So then I go out on the back of the boat. I'm holding the tow rope. And I, oh, oh, I get up. Awesome. Now I'm not separated from the boat because I'm holding the rope. If I was to continue white knuckling and holding that rope, that would be the way that I could be not abandoned by our captain. <laughs> but the problem is there are waves. And the captain was going a little bit fast. He was learning how to drive people wake skating. <laughs> I ate it really hard. And I want to talk about the difference between feeling and trusting. So was the life jacket's buoyancy, friends, based on my feelings? No. Was the captain's rescuing of me in the cold Lake Okanagan, which was beautiful, was the captain rescuing me based on my feelings? No. The life jacket works regardless of whether I feel it well or not, based on what it is. And the captain will come pick me up safely based on who the captain is based on his identity. And so friends, what kind of captain do we have in God? Over and over again, we see in our passage that God is one who is holy, who delivers, who does not put us to shame, and is a rescuer. So in moments, friends, when we compare how we feel when we're in positions of danger or trouble, we know that we don't have to live out of our feelings. We can live out of our trusting in who Jesus is. And the object of our faith is that which saves us, Jesus. And so I said, what is the context of David's life that it could be this erratic? Well, maybe it was King Saul hunting him down to kill him in 1 Samuel 23. Maybe it was his son Absalom, his rebellion to taking the throne, 2 Samuel 15. Remember how we were talking about like how abandonment can happen in the family and it is incredibly crushing and brutal, something not to shy away from. Maybe it was David's family being carried away by raiders, his wives being stolen and taken away to the point of where he was going to be stoned. And I'm thinking, I'm trying to like identify, I'm like, David, what's going on in your life? And time after time, commentator after commentator that I'm reading, trying to catch, like, what is, what is going on in David's life? Guess what they said? They said this wasn't about David. And I don't want you to take my word for it. Take Tremper Longman the thirds. He says this, no, and he's a very, uh, in the Bible world, he's a famous dude. His name sounds like it too. No 
incident recorded of David can, to, can begin to account for this. It is not a description of illness, but of an execution. And while David was once threatened with stoning, which is what I referenced earlier in 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, when his family was stolen, this is a very different scene talking about Psalm 22. Whatever the initial stimulus, the language of the psalm defies a naturalistic explanation. The best account is in the terms used by Peter concerning another psalm of David. Being therefore a prophet, he, David, foresaw and spoke of who? Christ, of Jesus. So we can't deny that David is referring to his experience of abandonment. We don't know. But we can certainly affirm, friends, that this refers to Jesus at the cross. How can we be sure? Well, let's look at our second point, that Jesus experiences being abandoned by God. Psalm 22 speaks prophetically to the crucifixion, Jesus on the cross. 22 verse 16 says, which you just read, they have pierced my hands and feet. And verse 18 says, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now about the crucifixion, friends, which is when they hung Jesus our reigning king up on a cross a thousand years later, 1,000 years later, the author, the eyewitness, Matthew, writes this about what was happening. Matthew says in, verse, in chapter 27, verse 35, and when they had crucified him, Jesus, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. So they pierced his hands. They put him on a piece of wood and then they cast lots for his clothes. This is our king. A thousand years ago, he was spoken of in Psalm chapter 22. What an amazing psalm. But Psalm chapter 22 also speaks prophetically to the statements of Jesus on the cross. The actual, so if you're kind of like, maybe that's, a, maybe that's a coincidence. Maybe they divided a lot of people's garments up. Listen to what Jesus says. After I read from you Psalm 22, verse 1, where the psalmist David says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, verse 45. Is this familiar to some of you? This is an account of what Jesus said on the cross. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. That is, this is familiar to you now? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The exact same line. Identical. So like, if I missed this, I would be, this would have been really bad. And if we miss this, it would be really bad. Because the whole point of identifying with Jesus, the psalmist is doing it, Jesus is identifying with the psalmist to identify what's exactly happening in that moment of anguish, which is very, very important, extremely important to the salvation of the world. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, chapter 21, this is, what's, this is what happens. This is the what. If you're curious and you're like, what is happening? This is the what. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. So let's see that. Let's look at that again. For our sake, he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, for what reason? So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. Can I get a hallelujah out there? Okay. This is what's happening. So that God, in the person of Jesus, fully human, fully God, who knew no sin, it says in 2 Corinthians, he was not a sinner. He was innocent. He was holy. All these things over here, all the highs, he was holy. Jesus is holy and blameless and perfect and righteous and good and kind and compassionate. And he identifies with people in their lowliness. He became sin. He made him to be sin so that he was sin's representative Jesus went to the cross and said, I'm going to take on the abandonment of the world. I'm going to take on the abandonment of the world. So was 
Jesus truly forsaken by God? Yes. Hallelujah. Why is that good? You see, he says, my God, my God. He doesn't say, my father, my father. You see that kind of distance he, he has from God? Usually he says, my, you know, we say, our, you ever heard of the Lord's Prayer before? Come on, you guys probably heard this one, right? Well, how's it, how does it start? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. What does he cry at the cross in the moment of being abandoned by God for the, for the sins of the world? My God, my God, not my Father. So why does it matter that Jesus was truly abandoned? Why does that matter? Well, it matters because it's according to God's plan. His plan of salvation and redemption to bring us out of abandonment and loneliness. And if you don't yet believe that this matters, I want to talk about why we struggle with this in our culture. That we do struggle very significantly with abandonment. And to do that, I turn to the very famous Vancouver Sun, which is our local paper. And I believe that the human condition starts with a position of sin and loneliness and isolation. And there's this quest, there's this heart cry, there's this connection, this desire for community and belonging, for satisfaction in each of our hearts. And we set ourselves up for great trouble in this city because this city is one that is incredibly lonely at times. And if you don't believe me, believe this Vancouver Sun article. So on June 26, 2022, the article reads, BC lags behind other provinces in life satisfaction. Building community connections strengthens life sa satisfaction was the subtitle. And in it, uh, a girl named, uh, what was her first name? Katrina Martin said, in 2021 said, we should be friends. And so she started this in uh, Instagram group and said 200 strangers showed up at her first meetup in Kitsilano Beach last fall with name tags, card games, spike ball, and volunteers to help make connections and, and make awkwardness fade away fast. She said, everyone who comes is in the same boat, said Martin. And then she says this at the very end of her article. Loneliness and isolation has a physiological effect. I didn't have a friend group for a couple of years. I have that now, and it's something I don't take for granted. And so, friends, we are living in a world that struggles deeply with loneliness and abandonment and separation and isolation and disconnection. And at the same time, positively, in this struggle, we're longing for connection and for community and for belonging and for acceptance and for friendship. And the reason why Jesus, it's really good news that Jesus took on the abandonment of the world is because that we don't have to feel the pressure of making that connection happen anymore. We can't carry the weight of that connection on our hands. We don't have to be Jesus because we never could be. Jesus gives us an opportunity to break the cycle of disconnection and abandonment. It is done. And I turn to a, a pastor down in the U.S. in, a, in the state of Oregon, and he, he talked about he talked about this is what happens. His name is Paul Le Boutillier. I believe that's French. I, I rolled it. Paul says this. How can God forsake you in Christ when he has already forsaken his son on your behalf? It is finished. It's done. It's completed. There is no more forsakenness to dish out. Why is that sometimes I feel that God has forsaken me? You guys ever been there before? I'm going to read that again. Why is it that sometimes I feel that God has forsaken me? And Paul says, because those are your feelings and your feelings lie. Your heart, the heart is deceitful. It is actively trying to deceive you. So doubt your feelings. And so friends, for those of us who believe and confess and believe in Jesus Christ, we have a great hope that God will never leave us or forsake us. And the reason why we can say that is because he did it to his son. And his son took on the sins of the world. And so now I want to apply this to our lives. How does that sound? Good? So friends, we see that because Jesus was abandoned, we are no longer abandoned. Because Jesus was abandoned, we are no longer abandoned. We no longer live in fear of abandonment. We live by faith. And earlier we heard a testimony of Zach who shared about how God was with him in the highs and low 
of recovering through the different things that were going on in his life. I wanted to read Romans chapter 8, verse 38, which is to be pretty famous and pretty popular. Some of you guys are going to know this one, but just bear with me. Romans 8, verse 38 says what? For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, No height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, there is no other claim in the entire world like that. Nothing. We sung that earlier today. Nothing is better than God. Nothing is better than you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Nothing is better than you. And Jesus, you have said that nothing Jesus will be able to separate us from you. Thank you, Lord. So we no, no longer, as believers in Jesus, we're no longer living in fear of abandonment. So let's go back to my story as a kid in a crop field. Abandoned by men. Boys. Young boys. That sucks. Doesn't feel good. Some of us have been abandoned by humans before. The great promise of the gospel for you guys right now, oh, hallelujah, come to God. Be filled with his Holy Spirit. Never feel abandoned in that sense because we live by the truth. Because we no longer submit to feelings of abandonment. We live by the truth. And the truth will what? Do feelings set you free? Why not? <laughs> The Bible talks pretty openly about a couple things that set us free. One is the Holy Spirit, where the Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. And in this passage, which I'm going to read to you right now, it's the truth will set us free. In John chapter 8, verse 31, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, believed, 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 trusted, accepted, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Hallelujah. We no longer submit to feelings of abandonment. By God's grace, we believe the gospel, friends, that we are not abandoned in this world, that we're not isolated, we're not having to build things on our own. We're not alone. We're not alone. We're not alone. We live by the truth. So we're no longer living in fear of abandonment. We're no longer submitting ourselves to feelings of abandonment. And we no longer produce abandonment. We're not abandonment makers. We're restorers. We live by the Spirit. So we live by faith. We live by truth. And we live by the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was leaving, some of you guys may remember this. Jesus, when he died and rose again, he's like hanging out with his disciples in a room. And he's just like, it's better that I go. Could you imagine the, like, the feelings of abandonment they're going to feel in that moment? No! We built our whole lives around you. We're going to look like idiots. Anybody feel like an idiot for Christ sometimes? Where are you? Jesus, I gave my whole life for you. I look like a fool. And Jesus says to his very disciples, it's better that I go. Man, talk about abandonment issues. His disciples are rock and roll. Woo! What did he do? He said, it's better for, that I go, so that what? That I send the Holy Spirit. And he's not going to abandon you. So what happens at Pentecost? Whew. Praying, worshiping God. Jesus is gone. Is, is, is God really going to be true to his promises? Is God really going to send us the power to live by, by his ways? What happens? Wham. Oh. tongues of fire, Holy Spirit falls on the church. The church is ignited in mission. Jesus fulfills his promises and he lives by truth. He's good. And we're that very church right now. Let's talk about application right now. Pretty obvious Jesus is not physically in the room. But he says... 
He will not leave us or forsake us. And he fills us with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so now we know that we no longer live by fear or by feelings or continue to produce abandonment because it's not okay. Abandonment isn't good. It disrupts, breaks, destroys. And so what I'd love to do in response is just to ask maybe for those of you who feel like, man, I, I, need, a, I need to believe, I need to help myself in more, like, like the psalmist, I need to help myself in these moments of like feeling disengaged or abandoned by God. I need to ground myself in God's truth. So I wonder if everyone could just stand as we respond. And we're going to do a couple things. First thing, I love to just respond to the word. And one way that we're going to respond to the word is by taking the Lord's Supper together.